Então, muito boa tarde. Vamos recomeçar. Eu chamaria uh, a nossa moderadora, a senhora professora Dália Costa, uh, uma grande amiga da Confiar. Uh, muito bem-vinda. Uh, a professora Dália Costa é uma das pessoas que colabora uh, com o Instituto Superior de Ciências Sociais e Políticas e a Confiar na, no Observatório e Centro de Competências em Justiça Restaurativa. É o primeiro observatório eh, em, em Portugal para estudar as questões da justiça restaurativa. Muito bem-vinda, Sra. Professora, muito obrigado, estimada Dália. Chamo também Anne Adelist Estrin. Chamo também Russ Macy. Hello. Thank you so much. Oh, my um, o professor, professor Fausto Amaro está, infelizmente, com, com, com Covid, não pôde estar presente. Pede imensa desculpa e compromete-se a enviar um texto para as conclusões desta conferência. O Sr. Professor Fausto Amaro, recordo, que é professor jubilado do Instituto Superior de Ciências Sociais e Políticas e é uma das grandes sumidades em Portugal nestas matérias. E a Sra. Professora Rafaela Granja estará uh, em Zoom a partir de casa porque está uh, num período de gestação e, portanto, não conseguiu vir de Guimarães para, para, para Cascais. Uh, agradeço a todos. Pedia-se, se faz favor, à Sra. Professora para moderar uh, com a celeridade que for possível porque temos almoço por volta da 1h05. Uma, uma até já, obrigado. Muito obrigada. Eu começo naturalmente por agradecer o convite para poder, para poder aqui estar, a moderar este painel. Um, agradeço, evidentemente, uh, na pessoa do Dr. Luís Graça, tem sido, de facto, um trabalho muito produtivo uh, que temos vindo a desenvolver. Temos e falo no coletivo em nome do Instituto Superior de Ciências Sociais e Políticas. Agradeço, sobretudo, por me ter convidado hoje porque um, o tema que aqui nos junta, a todos e a todas, é um tema que me é pessoalmente muito caro um, e que é um tema onde o conhecimento, o desenvolvimento do conhecimento uh, faz falta e do ponto de vista da investigação é evidente que nós produzimos conhecimento para ajudar também a melhor definir uh, políticas públicas e para ajudar a monitorizar, a avaliar aquilo que na prática vai sendo feito. E aquilo que na prática vai sendo feito também pela Children of Prisoners Europe e uh, por Portugal. Por Portugal também pela Confiar. Uh, agradeci pessoalmente ao doutor uh, Luís Graça, mas evidentemente que o agradecimento é também institucional agradecer a Confiar pelos seus 20 anos de existência e, diria eu, pelos seus 20 anos de persistência. Em Portugal nós temos um traço uh, que já se vai tornando característico, que é só quando as instituições chegam à maturidade, quando atingem 20, 30 anos de existência, é que nós nos tornamos campeões. Uh, há pouco uh, ficou o repto uh, do Pat Townsend para nós nos tornarmos campeões e em Portugal fazemos lo não sei se de forma lenta ou de forma mais segura, procurando maior segurança para depois começar a dar os primeiros passos, mas em Portugal, de facto, de facto, passados 20 anos do trabalho que a Confiar tem vindo a fazer, é a altura um, propícia para que, juntamente com a Children of Prisoners Europe, comecemos a trabalhar nesta questão de uma forma muito mais clara, muito mais pragmática e trabalhar é o verbo que eu estou a usar intencionalmente. Um, dou as boas-vindas às pessoas que vão estar connosco neste painel, esperar um pouco, uh, porque também percebo que a uh, Anne Estrin ainda está sem uh, tradutor. Welcome. Um, e uh, dou também as boas-vindas, naturalmente, a um, Russ Messi, cujas apresentações já foram feitas, eu vou começando a ganhar algum tempo. A distância e na expectativa de rápidas melhoras, a professor Fausto Amar, meu querido professor, tanto que me ensinou, a parte daquilo que, que nós somos é aquilo que nos ensinam e ele ensinou-me bastante na minha vida e a parte daquilo que eu sou também, 
querido professor, rápidas melhoras, que o Covid não seja muito, não, não seja muito castigador. Um, e a Rafaela, parabéns. Rafaela, tenho muita pena que não estejas aqui para nós podermos também estreitar laços neste, neste processo de investigação a que eu me referi há pouco. Mas, de qualquer maneira, neste caso as razões são muito boas. Parabéns. Eu vou começar um, mantendo a mesma ordem, se estiverem de, de acordo, um, e vou começar pela Anne Stream por um, lhe perguntar, é a diretora do Centro Nacional de Recursos para as Crianças e Famílias das Pessoas Privadas de Liberdade, e eu começo por lhe perguntar o que é isto, que centro de recursos é este, qual é o vosso trabalho, o que é que têm feito, como é que conseguiram afirmar-se no panorama institucional, criando um centro de recursos para as crianças e famílias das pessoas em situação de reclusão. Thank you. It is fabulous to be in this beautiful country for the first time. Thank you. Um, the National Resource Center on Children and Families of the Incarcerated is at Rutgers University in New Jersey in the U.S. It began as a federal institution, as part of the federal government in Washington during the Bill Clinton administration, and it was designed to identify programs around the country that were serving Uh, children and families of the incarcerated. Um, it then went to, um, was not refunded during the next administration, as politics will often uh, color what gets done in the communities. And so we became a resource for training and technical assistance, um, which we have been since then, and training and, and pri providing support to organizations around the country and around the world who serve children and families impacted by incarceration. And we've been at the university since 2013, um, and we, we sort of collect the research, disseminate it, and then provide training and technical assistance. Great, great. Do you have a presentation I to do. show us? Yes. Uh, I can stay here. Yes, you can. <laughs> That's <laughs> good. <laughs> okay. Uh, So I'm going to spend a few minutes asking you, I mean, the, the, the comments that we've heard so far have been really wonderful. And one of the things I love about coming to COPE and to Europe is really two things that come together. One is some of the things you're talking about are things we grappled with in the 70s when I began 43 years ago. And then many things you're way ahead of us in thinking and in perspective. So I'm going to have us focus a little bit on perspective. And I want to start by saying that what we bring, each of us, into this room uh, makes a difference between what you see and what you hear and how you interpret it. Um, the, the, uh, the president of Confiar said this morning, we have to ask really good questions to focus the answers. But the questions and the answers are interpretations for each of us. We look at this picture and so many people see two girls who are whispering about the other. How many people see that? But lots of people see a child who's looking at her phone, texting, and doesn't even know the other two children. So whether you see, yes, so whether you see one or the other is perspective. Keep in mind that this is not one big monolithic type of family. We have the man in the Sunday business suit who also has someone incarcerated, as, as we heard earlier. And then we have all of the sort of stereotypes that we think about, about people whose families are impacted. Um, we have in the States, it's the numbers are huge, obviously and 94% of all the children are children with incarcerated fathers. And 87% of them live with their moms, and about 60% of them are unknown to any public system. They may collect benefits for you know, food supplement, um, they, they may get health insurance free, they may get some things, but they are not in the child protective services departments. They're not in the juvenile justice department. Um, and so we have to keep in mind the, the, the variations as well as the themes. 
We also have to remember for us that it is a continuum from the arrest. My mom or dad was arrested, now what? Through the pretrial, through the sentencing, through the stages of incarceration, the beginning, the middle, the end, the early pre-release, and the post-release. And some of these feelings that are listed here um, are feelings children have talked to us about in each of the stages. We often just talk about the incarceration and the imprisonment. The other stages are really important. So we have begun to shift this conversation slightly from just the politics and the organizational aspects, which are still troubling us, we still struggle with, to some of the impact issues, particularly focused on trauma and toxic stress. That the parental incarceration is noted now as an adverse childhood experience, which means that the child perceives danger for themselves, for their parent, or for the caregiver parent that they live with, caregiver. When they perceive life-threatening or dangerous experience, event, we now understand body chemistry, the levels of cortisol that flood the brain, that change behavior. Toxic stress, which isn't an event, but long-term poverty, emotional distress, particularly uncertainty, economic losses, and living instability over a long period of time causes the same body chemistry reaction that changes the architecture of the brain, causing behaviors that cause problems for kids. So these are the original adverse childhood experiences, and this is important because it is inclusive of abuse, domestic violence, alcohol and drug addiction in the family. <clears throat> but it also includes mental illness in the family, or just depression, and single parenthood. So when this study was done in the 90s, single parenthood and depression in the household was considered dangerous, which now it is not. It is treatable, it's supportable, and we are trying to say so is the incarceration of a family member. It is supportable, offers them support, and it is not in the same context as abuse or neglect. That's important. But these ACEs matter because of the behaviors that occur. Lack of controlling impulses. Lack of understanding cause and effect lack of predictability or understanding what that look means when you look at me that way, lack of calming down, lack of conversation, reciprocal engagement. I talk, then I wait, then you talk. You have a child that has problems with those things. They're not going to do very well in school. They may drop out of school. Those attachment disturbances that we talked about earlier that have been studied since Bowlby in the early part of the 20th century are real. And they cause the need for a child to look for a connection with other people, can lead to gang involvement. And I am never, ever blaming children for sexual misconduct or abuse. But if you put a child who desperately needs attachment in the wake of a sexual predator, you have trouble. Possibly early sexuality, possibly early pregnancy. And then, everybody in this room has an addiction to something, I promise. <laughs> and in the wake of addictions that we can't manage, we try more addictions. In the wake of trauma and toxic stress, we become addicted to substances, to shopping, to being online way past our bedtime, to other things. So these addictions um, are self-medicating, and all of this is part of the story for these kids. Now we're starting to say there's way more to the adverse childhood experiences. Bullying, peer rejection, 
poor academic performance, poverty, and in the United States, racism is at the top of the list, as I'm sure it is in many other places. The people who don't look like us are locked up in greater proportions than the people who do. Community violence, food scarcity, and by the way, the American Academy of Pediatrics has listed racism as a number one adverse childhood experience for people of color in the United States, causing the same trauma that all of this other stuff causes. Toxic stress, as I mentioned earlier, contributes to trauma. And so implications for programs, policies, and practices, I, what I want to dig into for a moment. Our popular responses right now in the states, we've been through trying to figure out how to organize systems of care and uh, data communication and all of that. And we're not all that successful at it, but we're still working. But now there's some new things that cause us to wait a moment and say, let's think about this and think of ethics about it. So the first one is mandating universal screenings. Several states, California was the first, that says that all healthcare providers have to ask about incarceration, mental health, addiction as part of an ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences Screening. Family members and advocates are not so sure about this. If they're asking to get, it's not a good idea. To collect the info, for what? But if they're asking to give resources, we can come to you or we have things to help, that's another story altogether. Implementing trauma-sensitive or trauma-informed policy and practice is another one that is popular now for everyone. So schools that come to us and ask for help becoming an incarceration-sensitive school, they'll say, can we connect it to trauma-informed services that we already have? The answer is yes as long as you understand and recognize the unique aspects of family incarceration different than abuse and neglect. Um, so responsibly interpreting the ACEs and maintaining confidentiality is really important. Years ago, Rachel Condry wrote, relatives feel forced to hide from the shaming gaze of others that lead them to withhold information and avoid connections that might help them. So we have to pay attention to the caregivers, the families, and how they are hiding. They hate it when we use the word identify. They say, we do not want to be identified. We want you to provide a service, tell us about it, and we'll come. They hide, unless we can provide them something that's going to work. Years ago, I received an award from the Obama administration. I'm one of the best things of my career. And so I said at that ceremony, if we only talk about this through a lens of child maltreatment and child abuse, then we're talking out of both sides of our mouths, so we say. Here we say, these are families that need support and connection to their parent, but they are harmed by their parents, right? They're better off without their parent, right? No. The answer is no. But if you only say that incarceration is the same as abuse, neglect, domestic violence, advocates, funders, people who spend money on programs will say, we don't necessarily want to fund programs to connect these kids with their parents. Let's give them supportive services in the community only. So we want to avoid that. So we've, the Center for Disease Control, before they were only focused on COVID, they reorganized this. And now they're calling uh, domestic violence, substance abuse, mental illness, separation, divorce, and incarceration household challenges. Challenges as opposed to dysfunction. It makes a difference, the words you use. So we are now focusing on the protective factors. What buffers and supports the children, the primary relationship with the incarcerated parent, other relationships, skills, emotional confidence and competence, influence, having a say, involving the children in what they want to happen. So what does that look like? 
hearing the child's voice, which we are very much involved in trying to figure out ethical ways to bring children in to have a voice in all programming. Nothing about us without us. That's a saying we use. Bring the children and the families in to define the problem and design the solution. That includes helping judges to develop family impact statements, which are happening in the UK, um, happening, I think, in, in a few other places around the US especially. Um, proximity policy means legislation and laws that say that family members have to be incarcerated as close to the family as possible. So if the prison choice, if there's a choice, the closer the prison, the better. Supporting the caregivers by de developing and designing caregiver guides, books, to tell them um, all the things they want to know, how to talk to children, whether or not to tell them the truth, how to answer their questions, how to prepare for visits. These guides can be on the website of the, of the prison or as part of community agencies. Seeing and including the incarcerated parents as buffers and protective factors. They are helpful to children managing trauma. We are seeing now one of the benefits of COVID, and I was one of the ones that clapped about not um, replacing in-person visits with video or remote visits. Families need to be there in person. But one of the benefits of the remote phenomena is that children um, are being able, uh, the, the parents incarcerated are being able to be, take part in parent-teacher conferences, uh, pediatrician visits, mental health counseling sessions by remote in some of our prisons, which is really, really a helpful policy for connecting. Engaging those that are personally impacted without explo exploitation. I was just on a panel recently with a young man who I've been working with for years, whose father has been incarcerated for a very long time. He's been one of the people that goes around and is a voice for children with impa uh, impacted by incarceration. And he told so many stories, but the one I want to share is the one about how often he's asked to speak at fundraisers, and they, they are so happy that they raised, you know, half a million dollars at this fundraiser, and he still has to go home and work two jobs to help support his mother. And he says, why is it that we are kind of ignored in terms of our real needs but you want our stories. So I, I want us to really consider that and having uh, uh, people available for them to talk to after we ask them to testify or to speak. Uh, task forces and white papers, these things that, these committees that governments pull together to say let's do X, Y, or Z. Our people in different states across the US say unless you appoint a champion, which I heard earlier, to follow it all the way through. Otherwise, you say, we're going to have a group meeting, we're going to write a paper, and that's it. Nothing happens after that. I talked a bit about identifying the children, gathering the information responsibly. We were chatting about data collection. Family members in the US are saying, we don't want you to cross data. Like, if you collect it from the prison, we don't want the schools to know about it. We don't want healthcare to know about it. Healthcare doesn't have the right to share their data, and neither do schools. And all of this is about stigma and shame. Um, and so then we get to defining child well being. Who defines it? It's a, something we grapple with all the time. Do we define it, us in this room? Because the caregiver parent, the incarcerated parent, the child protective services people will all have their own definition. So I'd like to say, and that wonderful question, which is more important, which is better, separating the child um, from the mother or letting that baby live in prison? We are now saying we don't know because we don't know the greater trauma, meaning brain chemistry. And when we have some science, we now have a few studies around the world looking at cheek swabs inside of the mouth of cortisol level when we have that. 
and we know how much cortisol a child experiences from separation from the mother as opposed to living in a strange family, which is worse. If you live with a family where they're connecting the, that baby to the mother, visiting in the prison all the time, that might, not, that might be the better of the child will be in question. So many questions. And finally, supporting truth. That's a big issue for us in the US. One of our researchers is calling it compassionate deception, meaning we're lying kindly not telling children the truth. And they know. They come and they say to us, we know this is a prison, or we know where my dad is. So trying to help support not only the answers to the questions, but what questions do we want to ask. So my, my closing thought is my favorite Einstein quote. We can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So we have to keep thinking this differently. Uh, we have tons of research. That 70% quote we have found not to be, eight, we can't find it in the research, uh, that 70% of children will end up in prison. We, we can't find it. It, it. it was a misquoted piece of research in the 1970s that was then requoted and requoted and requoted. 30, 25 to 30% is the best close connection we can get, and in many places the reason for it is because we're still thinking the old way of you know, how our, our children and families looked at, the stigma, the racism, and the lack of relevant support services are what's causing the problem, and we, all of us in this room, um, are in a place to be able to change all of those things. So I thank you very much. Thank you. Nós é que agradecemos tudo o que nos ensinou e uh, principalmente um, reter esta ideia de que é também uma questão de perspectiva. A perspectiva a partir da qual colocamos as perguntas, as perguntas que colocamos, a perspectiva a partir da qual olhamos para os problemas um, e uh, falou-nos naturalmente acerca do impacto sobre as crianças desde os níveis de cortisol. Uh, relacionado naturalmente com os níveis de, de ansiedade, do desempenho escolar, até a outras questões mais de ordem social, a integração que é ou não possível a estas crianças fazerem, uh, com uma experiência que é uma experiência da sua vida, na maior parte das vezes uma curta vida, uma vida com uma curtíssima duração, mas que já contém esta experiência trazida uh, pela experiência de vida do pai ou da mãe, uh, ou por vezes dos pais, do pai e da mãe. Falou-nos também naturalmente acerca do impacto para a sociedade, mas vamos aprofundar um pouco mais este, este tema dos impactos com Russ Messi. Obrigada também por ter vindo. Do you have something to share with us? Yes. Okay, please. Um, vai também partilhar uma, uma apresentação connosco. Vem do Child Centered Policy. Ele é um, polícia. Eu não vou traduzir a patente porque poderia não estar a fazer uma tradução em termos da categoria socioprofissional correta entre o Reino Unido e Portugal, portanto vou apenas dizer que é da polícia e deixar que uh, complete a sua apresentação. Obrigada. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is lovely. And um, Confiar, thank you for having me. While you're putting your headphones on, because I speak really quickly, I'm just going to stand up, because <laughs> on the back row, I know I'm being told to slow down, on the back row, you probably can't see my shiny head very well, so if I stand up, you'll see it better. I was taught a long time ago to start with a laugh, and having gone bald at 18, it's always been quite easy. So. <coughs> <coughs> right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you ever so much for having me. I'm going to talk to you today about Operation Paramount. Uh, Operation Paramount is a police term. I'm a police officer, I'm a cop. We talk like cops. In the UK, we all look like cops. Um, we act like cops. There's a thing in the UK with policing that we, that we act without thinking, because we have powers and laws, and we have a routine. We know what to do. But then we're also aware that other partner agencies think without acting. So it's quite nice to get an opportunity to put those two attributes together. We're good at acting, and other people can think for us and help us with that. So this is wonderful today. So Operation Paramount is literally, an op I'm using the word identifying, look. 
I'm going to change this slide now on the back of the, the, the last input. That's actually really interesting. Um, so Operation Paramount is around how we can identify and recognize the sheer scale of children who are impacted by parental imprisonment in the UK. When I say the UK, specifically England and Wales, because our Scottish police system is slightly different and our court system doesn't join up quite as well as it might. Um, so I started looking at this issue about four years ago. I was a schools officer before I was promoted. And as an officer in schools, I was asked to support families individually when there were issues. And I was introduced to Sarah Burroughs from Children Heard and Seen, who some of you are nodding because she's lovely. And I met with Sarah, we had a coffee, and she told me that this family that I was trying to support, we only knew about that because the child had told the parent, sorry, the child had told a teacher at the school that dad had gone to prison. The school then reached out to me and said, <gasps> how can we help this child? And I had no idea, I didn't know. Um, so I spoke to Sarah, I found her on Google. And we had a chat and over half an hour, the bit that stuck with me the most was that she told me that there was no statutory uh, program to, uh, to, to tell us which children are affected when they are affected. And I thought that can't be right. I've got data systems upon data systems upon programs. I've got so many passwords I have to write them down. I've got access to all these programs that tell me information, especially as a police officer. So to find out that no one knew for sure which children were affected, it literally blew my mind. And it bugged me for about a year and a half. And then at the start of the pandemic, I was moved on to a new unit. We're called the Violence Reduction Unit. And we're independently funded by the UK government to look at pu uh, public health approaches to reducing violence in public spaces. So it's all about how we prevent young people committing violent offences in, in, in public. But one of the issues we looked at was adverse childhood experiences. And I recognised this list of experiences, and I saw parental imprisonment. I said, oh, that's what Sarah was talking about. So that's what started Operation Paramount. And we, we have always, police have always had access to information about families. So you can read the slides as I talk. I'm going to share the slides via email, so it's, it's deliberately quite a lot of writing on purpose, because you can take that away and share it. But we've always had information about when people are released from prison. So the, the, the UK police are quite good at preparing for when somebody gets out. Not in a nice way, not in a supportive way. I'm not claiming credit for this. This isn't good. But we have progress, uh, programs in place where we say, if someone's being released, can we make sure the victim of the offence knows if they need to know, if they need to know, if there's an ongoing risk to them, or if somebody's being released. I'll give you a very silly example, but if someone's being released and they committed a public sexual offence, is the release address they're going to, is that an appropriate place for them to be living? It's all very negative, so it's, it, it's not the way I like to present. I'm a positive guy, I smile a lot. But those, but those processes are in place. So I said, well, if we have the information about the prison releasing the adult, where's the information about the prison receiving the adult? And we were told, well, you can't have that. Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service are wonderful but they have a lot of information that they weren't sharing previously through lots of concerns, all very valid, mostly around what we do with that information. Who do we share it with? What's the point? We've talked before with the last, what's the point? We've got the information, what are you going to do with it? So when we approached them and said, well, we've got a charity in Oxford called Children Heard and Seen who support children in the community. And you've got information about which children would benefit from being supported. Why can't we put those together? And that's Operation Paramount. So what happens with Operation Paramount is that every day, at six o'clock in the morning, we receive a download of every single adult that's entered the secure system in England and Wales. It's huge. It's a lot of data. We then run that data against partnership data to see which children are linked to that adult. So for example, with the police data we have, we know about drug possession cases, domestic abuse in the home, if we've sectioned somebody under the Mental Health Act, we have information about that. There's lots of the adverse childhood experiences that we know about that we have information about in the police systems. Not always, but most of the time, we have information whether or not a child lives in the home that the police have attended, because that's a statutory requirement for us to record that. Not always, some officers miss it. So then we started looking at those adult names against the police database to say, well, how many children live with that adult? 
but that information is only as good as the information that the imprisoned adult gave to the prison. So sometimes they would say, I have no, I, I, no, no fixed abode, or I don't have a place to live. Or when I get out, I don't know where I want to go to when I get out. So we didn't have a reception address or release address. So we then had to start cross-matching the dates of birth of the adult, the name of the adult, previous addresses that were known to the police. We then realized that actually not all children are going to be known to the police anyway. Um, this, a lot of families, there might be an isolated incident, it might be a one-off, it might be a historic offense that the adult is in prison for. It's got nothing to do with the family. The children are in protective, caring homes. The police have never been there. So then we approached children's social care. We approached the county councils and said, well, which children do you know about? We know about these ones. And we pr then we've approached them because they said, well, the county council control education data. Because our county councils in England and Wales know which schools have which children and which adults are listed as the primary contact for those children. We then approached uh, ambulance services and said, have you got data about which children are at the houses that you send an ambulance to? And they said, yes. So, well, can we have that? They said, yes. So we've now got a database of seven local authority and partnership agencies that also feed in data automatically. So when we get the data from the adult, it washes through, it's called Thames Valley together, and I can share this information via email. It washes through against other partnership data and spits out the name of the child. Now this is where it gets positive, because a lot of that's quite... At that point, we know there's a child who has been in, uh, affected by parental imprisonment, or uh, to our best, the best of our knowledge, there has been. We then task a local officer from Thames Valley Police, who are my employers, to visit the home. And the words they use are up to them, and they're not all very good at it yet. We've got work to do on this. But what they should be saying is, we've been a part of a problem for your family. We can't apologize for what happened, but what we can do is put some support in place to make it slightly less rubbish for you. That's effectively it. We offer them the support of Children Heard and Seen, and we leave information about the charity. Now, this is really important. If the family consent to us sharing their information, we then approach Children Heard and Seen and say, here's a referral for this family. We will not do that without re uh, consent for referral. That's really, really important. At that point, we then look at the ch children's social care data, and if that child is open or available to statutory support, whether that's for a child in need or a child protection program or early help, we call it, if they are known to child care, we make them aware of the adult going to prison. Only, only if the child's open, and that's to make sure that their plans to support the family are lined up with our or children heard and seen support, and they can work together to give the best support. If the, ch if the child is not known to children's social care or is not open to them in any way, we have agreement with them that we don't tell them. They don't need to know. I'm going to move through very quickly. So this is where we are with it. Um, we've currently done a seven-month trial. We started last October. And so far, since October until April, uh, May the 22nd, was the last time I updated my slides for this, we identified 169 children across the three counties of our area. That's Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire, and Berkshire. Our population is about 2.17 million. So about 2.2 2, 2 million is our population. And we have 169 children over seven months. Some very, very crude mathematics tells us that nationally, if our population is consistent with other areas, which it probably won't be, we'd be somewhere in the region of 8,500 to 9,500 children per year. If you then take a 13-year average sentence, which again is very crude, I appreciate, but if you take an average sen sentence of 13 years, and that's as of last year, you're looking at about 110 to 120,000 children at any one point in England and Wales. It's not as high as previous estimates, I understand, but perhaps it's more manageable. Perhaps it's also more accurate. And I guess the main thing now is what do we do, what do, we do going forward? We know about the children, some of them. How do we make sure that they accept the offer of support, or at least that they understand how supportive it is? Because I think sometimes a uniformed cop knocking on your door within a week of them coming and kicking it down might not be very helpful. I recognize that some of my police colleagues are interested in crime only and nothing but crime. My decision-making, financial decision-making colleagues want to know how I can reduce crime right now, not how, with the proper support in 15 years' time, children won't offend because they've been supported. They're not interested in that necessarily. So that's our new challenge. I'm a champion. Thanks to Pat, I'm now a champion. 
Um, and going forward, I, I need more champions, especially in the police. But this process is replicable. There is nothing here that's... The only unique selling point, the USP, is that we use data that was already available, we just used it earlier. That's it. Nothing's new. I didn't invent anything. My master's degree is in policing, policy, and leadership, not in being clever. This was literally about using data that's available and offering help and support. It's a positive thing. And we know that Children Heard and Seen have supported over 600 children. Only two of those children have offended. That's not 60, 70 percent of children. That's two out of 600. With the right support, children can achieve anything. Children must be judged on whether they are kind and whether they are hardworking. That's it, as far as I'm concerned. You don't judge a child for their circumstances or the behaviour of the adult in their life. And when we get it right, when we get it right, we get it right. It's not often. So my details are there. I'm on Twitter. My email's there. I'd love to discuss this with any other agencies, any other countries looking at data, particularly around the way that I've got colleagues here from the police. Good to see you. Particularly the way how policing colleagues can help support families and put right a little bit of the impact that we have through our day-to-day -day activity. And thank you. Thank you very much, Russ. Um, sim, de facto, colegas, uh, como dizia, disse agora mesmo uh, o Sargento Russ Messi, colegas das Forças Policiais na sala, uh, PSP, GNR, também lá atrás, só a meio. Um, referir que, de facto, em, em Portugal tem vindo a ser crescente o empenho e o compromisso das Forças Policiais, tal como também da magistratura, uh, em adotar uma nova perspectiva, em tentar uh, resolver os problemas. Temos aqui, do meu ponto de vista, estou a olhar agora uh, para o Luís Graça, alguns temas que darão lugar a outras conferências. Em Portugal temos também uma questão delicada com um, um regimento de proteção de dados muito, uh, enfim, vou dizer pela positiva, que também sou otimista, pouco permissivo, um, não, não, não muito autoritário. Portanto, temos aqui mais uh, possibilidades de novas conferências para não ficarmos sem hora de almoço e, de facto, eu estou uh, neste papel que não é muito delicado de tentar fazer com que terminemos a horas. Um, penso que a Rafaela já estará pronta para entrar, Rafaela Granja, da Universidade do Minho, Pesquisadora, já cá está, pesquisadora da Universidade do Minho um, e, Rafaela, apelo, por favor, a alguma capacidade de, de síntese para um, nós não nos alongarmos uh, e podermos ter ainda energia para o período da tarde, porque o programa promete. Muito obrigada claro pela tua sim. presença. Bom dia a todos e a todas. Antes de mais, agradecer a confiar o convite que me foi endereçado e lamento muito não estar presente, é pelo supremo interesse da criança, neste caso a que trago dentro de mim, é, que me impede de viajar. Uh, ainda assim, uh, agradeço muito a, disponi uh, a disponibilidade de confiar para me aceitar neste formato. Uh, como este é um evento bilingue, a minha apresentação também será bilingue, no sentido em que está escrita em inglês, mas eu falarei em português também para tentar auxiliar o processo de tradução que é tão desafiante e obrigada desde já aos profissionais que eu estão também a assegurar. Então, eu sou investigadora, há uma década atrás iniciei um trabalho sobre as relações familiares em contexto prisional e é desse, desse trabalho de campo que surge então a minha tese de doutoramento, que foi terminada em 2015, e cujo livro em português está disponível uh, desde 2017, existem também várias publicações publicadas em inglês que podem aceder e, portanto, uh, o trabalho que eu aqui trago hoje é apenas uma, um sumário muito, muito, muito conciso daquilo que efetivamente eu encontrei nas prisões portuguesas. Comecemos então por olhar para o, o contexto português, que já foi falado ao longo da manhã, portanto, em Portugal nós não sabemos quantos reclusos e reclusas são pais e mães, portanto, não existe a recolha destes dados por parte um, das entidades uh, que os poderiam disseminar, uh, não obstante, existem alguns estudos académicos que mostram que cerca de 85% das mulheres reclusas são, mulher são mães 
e uh, 67% dos uh, homens reclusos são pais. Considerando que existem mais homens do que mulheres presos, não obstante serem mais as mulheres reclusas que são mães, indica que temos mais filhos de pais reclusos uh, do que filhos de mães reclusas em contexto exterior. Uh, mas é importante aqui destacar mais uma vez que não sabendo o número de crianças que são afetadas pela reclusão dos pais e das mães, é também muito mais difícil traçar políticas públicas que nos permitam olhar, trabalhar com estas crianças. Também já foi dito ao longo da manhã que em Portugal é possível que as crianças permaneçam na prisão até aos 13, excepcionalmente 5 anos. Uh, a lei portuguesa é neutra face ao género, ou seja, permite isto tanto a mães como pais, não obstante é, é preciso compreender que não obstante a, a neutralidade da lei, uh, o que acontece é que não existem homens nas prisões que tenham os filhos consigo, até porque as prisões portuguesas masculinas não detêm as condições logísticas e operacionais necessárias para que isso aconteça. Para além disso, gostaria também de dizer que Portugal não tem políticas que efetivamente sejam específicas para promover o contacto entre pais, mães reclusos e os filhos que estão no exterior. Portanto, já foi falada da comparação entre um sistema de visitas íntimas e a inexistência de um sistema de visitas para a família alargada. Fiquei muito contente em saber que esse projeto está a ser pensado no âmbito da Direção-Geral, porque é algo que desde há uma década que eu ouço reclusas e reclusos um, falarem como algo que consideram absolutamente essencial e necessário para a manutenção de laços familiares durante o, a reclusão. Quando, quando falei com reclusos e reclusas e também com os seus familiares, porque eu realizei entrevistas a 40 reclusos e reclusas, 20 homens e 20 mulheres, uh, re realizei entrevistas também a 30 familiares e para além dessas entrevistas eu passei um ano nas prisões, seis meses numa prisão feminina e seis meses numa prisão masculina, a perceber a gestão das relações familiares em contexto prisional. E quando falei com todas estas pessoas, inclusivamente também com vários profissionais, eu percebi que os principais desafios e tensões da gestão de relações familiares e sobretudo da parentalidade em contexto prisional passam, em primeira instância, pela reorganização das responsabilidades do cuidado. Portanto, quando uma mulher que era responsável pela educação de uma criança é presa, isto implica uma reconfiguração do cuidado dessa criança. A mesma coisa em relação ao homem, se ele também tivesse um papel ativo na vida do filho ou da filha. E o que nós vemos em Portugal, à semelhança do que acontece noutros países, é que independentemente do sexo dos reclusos, geralmente são mulheres que asseguram os cuidados às crianças. Ou seja, quando uma mãe é presa, normalmente é uma avó, que toma conta daquela criança. Quando um pai é preso, normalmente é a mãe da criança que toma conta da criança. Estou a falar da generalidade, há exceções a este cenário, obviamente, mas isto mostra-nos uma reprodução das desigualdades de género na medida em que são as mulheres, efetivamente, que fora dos muros continuam a assegurar os, os cuidados, ou a maior parte dos cuidados às crianças. E isto devia nos fazer pensar, efetivamente, conhecendo o problema, construir caminhos para o conseguir abordar. Um segundo ponto muito destacado é a inconsistência de contactos de, uh, ao longo da reclusão devido à indisponibilidade de recursos. Temos três principais formas de contacto para, uh, entre o interior e o exterior da prisão, sendo elas uh, as visitas, atualmente diferenciadas devido à pandemia de Covid, mas pensemos nas visitas presenciais, os telefonemas e a troca de correspondência. Os telefonemas e as visitas são formas de contacto que podem ser extremamente onerosas para, reclu para recluso e para familiares. Se o recluso ou a reclusa estiver detido longe 
do seu contexto habitacional, há uma, há uma viagem que tem de ser feita e que acarreta um custo. Para além dessa viagem, há também normalmente a vontade por parte dos familiares de levarem comida ou levarem dinheiro para os reclusos. Isto implica, portanto, um, um, uma, um, um custo que é significativo, sobretudo porque estamos a falar de populações altamente vulneráveis do ponto de vista socioeconómico. E, portanto, o que é que isto implica para as crianças? Implica que, por vezes, por mais vontade que uma família tenha de sustentar visitas assíduas para que a criança possa ter contato com o seu pai ou com a sua mãe, por vezes isso é impossibilitado devido à indisponibilidade de recursos. A mesma coisa em relação aos telefonemas, uma vez que em Portugal são os reclusos que estão responsáveis por pagarem uh, os contactos telefónicos, há famílias que não têm disponibilidade de sustentar este custo e para além disto, até bem recentemente, os contactos telefónicos estavam limitados a 5 minutos por dia. Eu sei que esta situação mudou durante uh, a pandemia e, tem, e há, um, há vários projetos pilotos em vários estabelecimentos prisionais que também reconfiguraram este cenário, mas não obstante, 5 minutos por dia para falar com a família, e inclui, incluindo aqui as crianças, era apresentado pelos recusos e pelas recusas com quem conversei como algo que impossibilitava completamente uh, uma manutenção de um contacto Assíduo e de um contacto que se cria, efetivamente, no sentido da manutenção dos laços com as crianças. E, portanto, perante este cenário, os reclusos e as reclusas tendem a mostrar que se sentem impotentes para, efetivamente, ajudar as suas crianças, que estão em contexto exterior, e para as acompanhar devidamente. Não obstante, estes desafios e tensões que encontrei, os reclusos e as reclusas com quem falei e também as famílias são extremamente resilientes e, portanto, também acabam por dinamizar aquilo que eu chamei de uma negociação criativa do envolvimento, face a todas estas restrições que eu acabei de falar e que são apenas um pequeno número, poderia falar de muitas outras. Em primeira instância, porque recusos e recusas tentam efetivamente gerir um cuidado que é coordenado entre eles e os cuidadores das crianças, em contexto exterior, sejam, sejam eles quem forem, uh, envolvendo-se numa negociação constante entre o, o, aquele que é o papel dos pais e das mães que estão presas e o papel dos, dos cuidadores. Dou aqui o exemplo de uma recusa que eu entrevistei, a Cláudia, que Uh, apesar de estar presa, uh, tinha definido junto dos cuidadores, que eram os, uh, os cuidadores da sua filha, que eram os seus próprios pais, que uh, uh, seria a Cláudia quem decidiria se a filha iria às visitas de estudo, a que horas é que tinha de chegar a casa se fosse passar tempo com uma amiga, se podia ir à piscina, se podia ir à praia. Portanto, a Cláudia conseguiu aqui um acordo com os, com os cuidadores daquela criança para efetivamente continuar a estar nela o poder de decisão em relação a atividades cotidianas da filha. Um, para além desta definição de tempos de lazer e de outro tipo de questões, há também vários recursos que tentam lidar com as questões escolares das crianças. Lembro-me, por exemplo, do Samuel, todos os nomes que eu estou a utilizar são fictícios para proteger o anonimato das pessoas que colaboraram no meu estudo, o Samuel que entrou uh, para a prisão com, uh, quando a, a sua companheira estava grávida e que portanto todo o contacto que teve com o seu segundo filho foi mediado pelo contexto prisional e o Samuel então uh, pediu a toda a gente, inclusive à mãe e à, à família alargada, que fosse ele a ensinar inglês ao filho durante as, as visitas prisionais. E, portanto, o Samuel passava as visitas prisionais com o filho a ensinar-lhe inglês para que ele, na esperança que quando o filho crescesse, pudesse ter a memória que, não obstante o pai estar preso, foi ainda assim ele que o ensinou inglês. E, para além disso, temos também várias tentativas de recriar a, a, a presença à distância. E volto aqui a, a convocar o exemplo da Cláudia, que todos os dias, à mesma hora, sentada na sua cela, brincava uh, com jogos infantis, 
sabendo que a filha estava a fazer exatamente o mesmo no seu quarto, em casa. Não havia contacto, não havia uma videochamada que as ligasse, mas ainda assim havia esta tentativa de recriar a sua presença, mesmo que esta presença seja efetivada à distância. Outros exemplos poderiam passar uh, pelo caso da Antónia, que tentava ensinar caligrafia aos filhos por via da troca de cartas, da troca de correspondência. E, portanto, apesar da parentalidade na prisão permanecer um problema social completamente invisível, e volto aqui a congratular, a confiar por, em Portugal, estar a trazer este tema ao debate público, ou pelo menos assim espero que assim possa acontecer, a parentalidade na prisão não tem políticas públicas que efetivamente trabalhem com esta necessidade de apoiar os pais no contacto com os filhos. A parentalidade na prisão é marcada pela amplificação de assimetrias de género, que têm implicações tanto dentro como fora da prisão, e todas estas formas de negociação criativa do envolvimento familiar que eu acabei de exemplificar, e são apenas alguns exemplos entre centenas, de, entre centenas deles que encontrei, são ainda assim altamente condicionadas e muito, muitas delas são impossibilitadas porque estão além do controle dos reclusos e das reclusas e passam por restrições prisionais que, que focam a vigilância e a segurança em primeira instância e, portanto, relegam para segundo plano outras necessidades. As negociações que efetivamente existem com, entre pais, mães e cuidadores externos, que podem nem sempre ser harmoniosas, e por fim, a escassez de recursos económicos. Muito obrigada pela atenção, espero não me ter demorado a dizer tudo. Muito obrigada, Rafaela, pela tua disponibilidade para aqui estares a partilhar também conhecimento, apesar de ser uh, deste, desta forma, como nós dizemos, através do meio frio, mas de qualquer maneira foi calorosa a tua presença. Obrigada por, por estares. Um, não temos tempo para qualquer debate, de qualquer maneira, muitas questões ficaram e, de certo, elas vão... Uh, ao fim e ao cabo, acabar por voltar uh, acima da mesa no período, no período da tarde. Eu gostaria apenas de deixar duas resultantes deste, deste painel. A primeira, como medir impactos? Como é que nós avaliamos os impactos? Quais são os indicadores? O que é que nos permite, de facto, cientificamente, medir impactos, incluindo uma perspectiva ética nesta avaliação? A segunda pergunta, como incluir as crianças particularmente em Portugal, como incluir as crianças no planeamento e na avaliação das políticas públicas. São perguntas uh, que nos devem uh, estimular a procurar as respostas. Não teremos respostas muito imediatas para estas perguntas, mas de qualquer maneira, pelo menos uh, das pessoas presentes, sabemos que contamos com todos vós e com todas vós para aproximar um pedacinho da resposta e co-construir uma resposta. Muitíssimo obrigada a confiar, muitíssimo obrigada a Co pelo vosso trabalho também. Até à tarde, voltaremos às duas e meia após, após o almoço para os trabalhos da tarde. Muito obrigada. Boa tarde. O almoço vai ser servido e é oferecido a todos os participantes, vai ser servido no Centro Cultural de Cascais. Portanto, são três minutos a pé e, e será oferecido a todos os participantes. Muito obrigado. Às 14h30 temos mesmo que começar. Muito obrigado.